Hello. Today's video is going to be about performance indicators. Performance indicators can be used in one of two ways. Uh, the first way is to find the relative poles uh, for a given transfer uh, function so that it will minimize the uh, error or some performance index that we're going to talk about. Uh, the second way is um, a less desirable way where you can use it to uh, adjust the gains and then take a look at the response after the fact and use the performance indicator to tell whether or not you've changed the gains in the right direction or the wrong direction. But I want to talk about uh, placing the poles first. And the, uh, the three performance indicators are the integrated absolute error, the integrated time absolute error, and the integrated uh, sum or squared error. So uh, to explain what these are, uh, let's just say we're doing a step jump from 0 to 1 and uh, we have a third order uh, transfer function here and then we have this is the uh, forcing function. We have uh, three coefficients and what, to have it so that the gain is equal to 1 at the very end, uh, the gain here and, and uh, the a0 must be 1. So we're really only going to modify um, A2 and A1. So what is happening here is that we take the error between the target and the um, actual, and we uh, take the absolute value and, and we just add it up. So basically we're adding up all of this area, this area, this area, this area, and whatever area might be you know, very small here, and then using that as a uh, performance index. And the, obviously the idea would be to minimize the area uh, in these, or minimize these areas. So if you had a real fast response that went up like this, that would be much better than this response. But uh, the main purpose of this is to find the uh, transfer function that will give us the best response uh, given the uh, whether or not we're using the integrated absolute error or integrated time absolute error or the integrated uh, squared errors. So let's go uh, to the beginning. All these uh, three methods are almost identical. They change very little between the three different worksheets that I have here. I'm displaying two because I don't think I could get three on the uh, screen. Um, what we're doing is we're uh, writing out a differential equation and what we're trying to do is guess some values for A1 and A2 that are going to make this response optimal. And we have uh, uh, three states. We have, well, let's just talk about this in terms of position. We've got a position, oh, well, since it's third order, let's make it a velocity, um, acceleration, and jerk. And then this would be the uh, integrated uh, errors. So uh, I have my differential equation written here. So what I'm doing is I'm integrating my acceleration to velocity, my jerk into acceleration, and this is the derivative of the jerk, and that's getting integrated to be a jerk. And then what I need to do is take the velocity, this is my set point, uh, or reference target velocity, and I subtract the actual velocity. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm multiplying by the time. So what that does is it weights the errors right here very small, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. And in the case of the integrated absolute error, go up to the beginning here, you see it's lacking this t. So what happens is that each time period is weighted equally. And the same goes for the sum of squared errors. And the only difference with the sum of squared errors or integrated squared error as we're just taking this error and we're squaring it. So um, after that, you can see that the uh, three methods are almost identical, except for this one term right here. So to find the uh, parameters or the coefficients that will make the transfer function optimal, what we have is a uh, routine here that does minimizing. And what it tries to do is get uh, the, uh, in this case, the integrated absolute error as close to zero as possible. It's trying to minimize the error. And what it does is it calculates out these coefficients, and the, this is the error. 
And then down here, you can see the error, the coefficients are slightly different and the error is slightly different. Now, what's important is these coefficients, these numbers. So if you get anything out of this, you should, and you plan to use these uh, capabilities or uh, algorithms, I would look at, I'd record these numbers. But the problem that you have is that this only works for third order uh, equations. If you wanted to use a fourth order transfer function, you'd have to have a y3 in here, add an extra row, and move this um, differential equation down, put the y3, and then there would be a minus a3 times uh, y3 added to this. So anyway, now that we've got the, uh, uh, the values, numeric values for the coefficients for the transfer function, I'm going to just cover the uh, integrated absolute error because, again, these are almost identical. You can see the uh, coefficients change a little bit, but not that much. So to use it, what we do is we need to have a, uh, a gain parameter. And this gain parameter is a frequency. So I'm going to call that gain parameter lambda. And since s is a frequency and lambda is a frequency, they kind of cancel each other out. So at the end, what you end up with is something that's unitless. I'm going to plot uh, the Bode plot. And you can see the Bode plot is very flat. And uh, because there are three poles, we have a, a phase delay of 270 degrees, which, which is what you expect. So. Uh, what I can do is uh, change this lambda, and if I make this a 10, what I'll do is I'll increase the bandwidth by 10. So what will happen is that this corner here is going to move up to here. Now watch this. I've got to get the zero in the right spot. So it moved right where I expected it to move. And so what ends up happening is that once you have these uh, two coefficients, the only thing you need to change, if you're happy with this kind of response, is the, uh, um, the gain parameter, which is really a frequency. So let's take a look at what happens to the poles. I'm going to put this back to zero, or to one, and uh, come down here, and let's display the poles. And you can see there are three poles, two are complex, which is what you'd expect. And you can, what I'm doing is I'm finding the, uh, the roots. So here's my one real pole and, and two imaginary poles. I don't like the fact that the imaginary poles are closer to the origin than uh, the real pole. But that's the way this works. And the other uh, two methods uh, are about the same. So let's take a look at what happens when I change that uh, uh, gain parameter. I'm going to change it to a 10. And what's happening is that uh, uh, you can see that the uh, poles are 10 times farther away from the origin. So it looks like uh, a couple of them have gone, yes, they've gone past, they're at 11, so they're up here someplace off the, uh, the screen. But you can see that this is the pole locations when uh, that lambda is equal to 1, and uh, here's the pole locations when lambda is equal to 10. So let's go back to uh, uh, the lambda being equal to 1. And let's look at the response. Again, I'm using differential equations. Got to do the calculations. And this is the response when lambda is equal to 1. Now, if I want to make this faster, I can make the lambda equal to uh, 10. And we'll just take a look at that. 10. And now go back down. Oh, I had changed the lambda in a different spot here. That was at already at 10, uh, or 2 pi times 10. Let's make this at 20. Yep, 
and you can see the response is much faster. So before it went up about here, now it's going up to about there. So the rise time is getting shorter. Let's make it 100. Oh, let's make it 50. Okay. You can see that through even faster yet. Now, there's a problem with this. Uh, what this method does is it finds the closed loop transfer function that is optimal, and then you're changing this gain parameter to increase the response. But in reality, what you have to do is take in consideration that the controller has a limited output, plus or minus 100% of you know, the current or voltage or whatever it may be, and uh, you might reach saturation long before you can uh, uh, increase this value up to 50. In other words, it might have reached saturation at 20. So uh, there is a limitation as to how uh, big you can make this, uh, this tuning parameter. So now that we have the, uh, the two gains and the ability to change the response with the tuning parameter, what do you do with it? Well, now you've got to calculate out the PID gains. The PID gains uh, can be calculated like this. I'm going to use pull uh, placement again. So I have my uh, second order system and my PID, and when I combine them, I get a third order system, which is what we're finding the, or we're trying to optimize now. And again, if you had a fourth order uh, system, you would have, um, or a third order system, you would have a, um, a PID, which make it a fourth order equation, transfer equation. So you'd have to have yet another gain. That would be a second derivative gain. So in this case, what we do is we simplify and we have the third order coefficient or characteristic equation. And then we have the desired characteristic equation. This comes from above. And we match the uh, coefficients for each power of s. So we're matching this to this, this to this, this to this. And then we calculate out the, uh, we solve with the three equations. We can calculate three unknowns. And these are the symbolic formulas. So this is our tuning parameter. Uh, this is the uh, open loop gain, the uh, natural frequency of the system. Let's just say it was a, maybe it's a mass on a spring. Who knows? Um, and then we have a damping factor here. So these are the equations for calculating out the PID gains. Now, by comparison, uh, on all three of these, you follow exactly the same procedure at the very end to uh, calculate the PID gains. Now, as far as taking a look at the results, let's just uh, take a look here. You can see that this also makes a nice uh, uh, body plot. And the poles are about the same. And let's see, we got this at 10, and this is at, uh, let's make this 10. And the response is about the same. Uh, I think I like this one on the right, the integrated time absolute error. And it really makes sense to me that the integrated time um, absolute error would be better because what ends up happening is you end up uh, trying to correct for all of this in here that you have no control over. And that's especially a problem with the integrated uh, sum of errors because what ends up happening is you take the error between here and here and you sum it. And then as you go along, these errors are almost insignificant compared to these errors that you can't do anything about. So the errors here kind of get lost in the noise. Now, one thing you can do with the integrated sum of uh, errors or squared errors, you see that's the um, what it looks like if I just integrate the uh, squared error. And again, like I said, it doesn't work out all that well because the uh, 
errors at the very beginning uh, to kind of drown things out, all the other errors. But if I put a time in here, then what ends up happening is it doesn't wait the um, errors you that the um, algorithm can do nothing about. It doesn't wait, wait them as strongly. And uh, see, it's going to optimize this now. So you get a nice flat response. You actually get a better bandwidth. Poll locations are about the same. Response, um, it's a little bit faster, but you can see that it uh, um, oscillates around a little bit. And then again, this procedure is um, identical. So uh, that covers the uh, poll placement part. What I like about this is there's only one tuning parameter, which is the lambda. What I don't like about it is that it doesn't take into consideration that the output can saturate, so that there's a limit to how high you can make that one tuning parameter. The other thing I, I don't uh, like is the other method of using this, where uh, after the fact, what you're doing is you're taking a look at the uh, target position, actual position, and you're not, instead of changing the pole locations or optimizing the pole locations, you're trying to uh, optimize the gains, which doesn't optimize the pole locations. And so what ends up happening is that it's, you know, it works to an extent, but you could end up with poles being in very undesirable locations, such that if the plant changes much at all, you can uh, have systems that are unstable. Anyway, that concludes my video. Hope you enjoyed it.